great. Thank you. Hi and good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for another NL seminar. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jesse Thomason. Jesse is starting as an assistant professor at the University of Southern California in fall 2021 and is currently hanging out at Amazon Alexa AI for a year. Recently, he was a, po a postdoc researcher working with Luke Zettelmoyer at the University of Washington. His uh, research focuses on language grounding and natural language processing applications for robotics or robo NLP. Key to this work is using dialogue with humans to facilitate both robot task execution and learning to enable lifelong improvement of robots' language understanding capabilities. Uh, he has encouraged work in robo NLP through workshop organization at NLP conferences, robotics, and a vision menus um, throughout the years. So please join me in welcoming uh, Jesse and enjoying his talk. Thank you all. Thanks, Musta. Um, yeah, if anybody has any trouble hearing me through the talk, let me know and feel free to pipe up with questions uh, either in the chat or somebody may be monitoring it or just unmute and ask is fine too. Um, thanks for the great introduction. Um, that's about everything about me. And I am going to talk today about going from human language to agent action. And I'll spend a little bit of time defining uh, what I mean by agent, as well as the scope of human language that I want to deal with. And the motivation for this really comes from the language guided robots that we've seen in sort of sci fi. We know that sci fi historically has sort of driven technological advancement in computer science. And so when we see agents that can ask us questions, can ask us to examine our own internal states, or can just tell us what they've been up to, it's inspiring. And it kind of feels like we should be able to do that with the physical robots that are increasingly present in factories and even in home environments. So why aren't our robots already language guided? If we think about robots that are becoming more popular, um, for example, the very pricey and out of range Boston Dynamics robots are very motion capable. They can do a lot of very cool stuff, um, but they are sort of pre-programmed to do those behaviors. Um, a more grounded example would be something like a robot, uh, Roomba, which I have in my house now to clean up cat litter. Um, and it's great, but I do have to use an app to control it and tell it exactly where I want it to go and what I want it to do, where I'd like to just be able to tell it with my voice. And in research labs, there are robots uh, that can do things like assisted feeding to help differently abled folks uh, get around their house and work without the use of caretakers. But again, these have to be programmed by actual engineers and not the end user clients. But we have sort of programmable voice assistants like Cortana and Siri that can do things for us just because we ask them using voice. And even into embodied settings, things like Amazon Alexa or the Google Home uh, have you know, a device body that's not limited to a phone and can actuate in the world, doing things like turning on lights and changing the temperature in the house for smart homes. So it feels like those kinds of language technologies on these devices should be portable into robots. And it turns out there's a bunch of challenges in trying to get that to work. And that's where my work comes in. The thing I'll focus on today is that these embodied devices like uh, Google Home don't have any visual connection to the world. They sort of understand the world as a semantic map um, of things that they're able to touch. They don't have a camera where robots really require a lot of visual grounding. They exist in the world. They're perceiving the same space that we are and they have to navigate and move around within, within that world. So my work enables robots to perform language grounding, specifically via interacting with humans, using human feedback to try to refine their understanding of the visual world. And this really falls into um, a broader research vision that I want to outline um, in an argument that experience with the world really is what helps us ground language and understand what language means. So if we take a step back and think about the evolution of NLP over time as a, as a field, um, we can start out with sort of the lowest of, of world scopes of things that NLP has considered. And that is carefully annotated benchmarks like the pen tree rank or WordNet or the broad corpus. And that's really where computational linguistics and NLP really started to take root and get more traction using a lot of human labeled data. And we've moved now more into what we call world scope two, which is using the entire internet of unstructured text. So we've got all the text that we want, things like common crawl, uh, let us build tools like WordDevec. Um, but the argument that I would like to make is that that's not enough to really understand the kinds of language that people will use to tell robots what to do. 
And that's specifically, again, because it doesn't have any visual connection to the world. A robot really needs to understand what's happening in a room and what it's seeing in a room in order to interact with things. Like if I tell my Roomba to go clean up the cat litter, it has to see the cat box. So most current NLP research operates at this level of like, let's read the entire internet and try to do something cool with it. But you can't learn language from the radio, as the saying goes. And you can't learn language just from looking at text on the internet either. So we can widen this out to a third world scope, which is text paired with sensory data. So things like ImageNet are structured databases that have this kind of information, text together with image labels. It enables tasks like visual question answering. And now we're starting to get into this space of maybe we could get a Roomba to go to the right place. Most language folks playing with vision and vice versa hang out in this space of like image captioning and question answering. But I'd argue you can't learn language from a television either. Like sitting and watching TV doesn't allow you to acquire L1, right? Like maybe you can pick up a second language, but you certainly can't learn how to speak to another person from watching TV. So this brings us to world scope four, which is you really got to interact with the world. So language and an embodied agent, either in simulation or in the physical world that has to move around. And this starts looking like newer tasks from 2018 forward, like vision language navigation, interactive question answering, and sort of um, robo NLP uh, types of work. So this is where most of my work falls. But you also can't learn language by yourself. So this isn't quite enough in my, in my like overarching thoughts about NLP and its movement as we go forward as a field. Um, you really need to interact with other people to learn language, right? And we know that from uh, the development of human uh, language acquisition. So social embodiment is really where we'd like to push NLP towards human robot collaboration and dialogue, where we're really learning what language means by interacting with the world and with other people who are using language. And maybe that's AI complete. Um, that's never stopped us as a research field from trying to do it anyway. Um, so to, to bring us back to, to the ground, to Robo NLP and what I want to talk about today, uh, we're going to translate instructions to embodied actions, which operates at this world scope for of let's take language and try to learn how to use it in a simulated or a physical environment. So if a human instructor tells a robot, turn left and head to the stove counter, We'd like to translate that into a high level robot API of actions to take, like that I'm gonna rotate negative 90 degrees and then move forward three meters. And then some other system will take those robot actions and translate them into base motor accelerations for actually moving around. And there are good APIs to actually do this now, even for relatively cheap at home robots. I can't see my own camera, um, but maybe you can see what I'm pointing at. I've got this Locobot in the corner here and Locobot's pretty cheap. You can use it uh, in classroom settings, and it has this kind of high level API of like, let's just do rotations and movements, and then the low level base motor accelerations are taken care of. So, this is a reasonable abstraction. If I say something like, pick up the knife on the counter beside the toaster, I'd like to translate that into moving the gripper to grasp at particular coordinates. And again, have some low level controller that takes that grasping information and actually moves the robot arm and causes the, the grasp to happen. But this mid layer, this robot action API layer still requires the robot to be able to see and perceive the world. So even if we wanna translate here, understanding language requires context. If I turn left and head to the stove counter, if I don't recognize the stove counter, I might not go far enough or worse, I might go too far and actually run into it. If I wanna uh, pick up the knife on the counter beside the toaster, I need to recognize objects, the knife, the counter, the toaster and their spatial relations to one another to pick up the right object. So what I'm going to do is design data sets to translate these kinds of natural language commands into complex long horizon planning problems that a robot might encounter in the world. So the talk will be divided into two major contributions. One is on vision and dialogue navigation, and the second on interpreting the grounded instructions for everyday tasks. So I'll start with vision dialogue navigation, but I do want to pause since we're sort of through the motivation of the talk to see if there are any questions so far. Awesome. So I want to make the argument generally that benchmarks enable community driven progress, that it's like worthwhile to make data sets. Um, and so I'm going to look at benchmarks that have come out, especially in the last two years, uh, along two axes. And one is the level of interaction that a benchmarking simulator provides. 
So around 2018, a number of papers arrived at CVPR sort of at the same time, uh, trying to do language-based navigation. And that language went from very simple sort of template-based stuff up to real human language. So for template-based language, there was a paper called Embodied Question Answering, which I'm sure some people in this audience are familiar with for sure, where people uh, or an agent answered questions like, what color is the car? And these questions were drawn from templates, like what X is the Y. Uh, the agent's behavior then was to move through the environment, find the car, and answer the color. Um, so relatively simple language, simple enough that uh, unimodal vision-only baselines are actually better than trying to use the language at all. So it's better to use human language. Um, at the same conference, the room-to-room -room data set was released where an agent is tasked with moving through an environment conditioned on a human instruction. And these photorealistic environments are much richer, the language is longer, and it's gotten from real people, so it's higher fidelity. And these really drove a lot of progress in the community. I'm going to talk a little bit more about vision and language navigation, which we're going to build directly off of. Uh, this is based on the Matterport room-to-room -room simulator. The action space that the agent is allowed to take is left, right, up, down, and forward. So these are actions that change the camera viewpoint or the agent position. And the agent moves on a discrete navigation graph. There's sorts of a set of places that the agent can occupy in the simulated environment. So we're not dealing with continuous control. We're not dealing with any hard robotics problems. We're just dealing with how do we move through a visually embedded graph conditioned on a language instruction. And the initial model they present is just a sequence to sequence model. It's very easy to understand. Uh, given a language instruction, like turn around and exit the library, head down the stairs and across the room, we're gonna basically shove all of that text into learned token level language embeddings, run those through an LSTM encoder. And then at every time step, we're gonna take an action and get a new visual observation. So we'll use an LSTM decoder to move through our visual observations and a fixed ResNet embedding network to process the visual input and turn it into a vector for the LSTM decoder. So this is like the simplest model you can imagine for trying to take in language and images and produce a sequence of actions. And it works like fine. We're gonna build on this basic architecture. I'll note that a lot of work has been done that builds on top of this, that uh, modern architectures largely use transformer networks to understand both the language and the vision, and that gives a boost in performance. We'll focus more on the design of the benchmarks than on the modeling challenges that follow them in this talk. So given an instruction like turn around and exit the library that we showed a second ago, uh, again, we're basically just learning how to move through a visually embedded navigation graph. So if we start at that blue node on the left, you can see that we're currently in a library and we're headed towards this green node on the right, which is the kitchen. And there's a series of steps we have to make through this graph to get there. So this is a small action space and there are pretty short expert demonstrations. There's an average of six movements in the Matterport room to room data set to get from start to finish. So the trajectories are quite small. Um, the initial model got 24% success uh, compared to human performance. That's up to 91% uh, as of the leaderboards I checked a couple of days ago. Um, Can I ask you a question quickly? Yes. Um, so, sorry, I just was wanting to make sure I understand the task. Um, so you get the, the input is the instruction and then the output is going, you, you get to choose between like, let's say from the blue node, there's two sets of images that you could result in and you get to choose between them. Is that the idea? Uh, that's one way to frame it. The way that it's framed in the original task is you're at the blue node and you have just this visual observation of the library. If you take an action like turn left, you'll get a slightly different view of the same library, but you'll still be on the same node. But if you move forward, you'll change nodes. Uh, and that means you're sort of centered in a different place where you can see different things. Okay, um, so the turn and the exit could be considered two. You can think of that as two different moves, right? Th there are two different moves in the original formulation. Yeah. 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 Okay, so you have either so you have either turn or move. So in this case, you I, mean, I guess you could turn. I don't know, one way or, or not turn, and then you could move or, uh, and then, but it, but it's still, you're, you're choosing which to go to based on the input of the, the input text command and you're, you're classifying among the result images, right? That's right, that's right. Um, and a lot of the modern models, uh, rather than taking these discrete actions, actually look at the full panoramic space of images around your current node and explicitly say like, that image looks like the best one, so I'll move that direction. Right, so yeah, yeah and that's your, your input could be the 360. Or yep. whatever, or the, the, the full. Okay, cool, thanks. 
Cool. Um, so as John mentioned, there's a number of ways to reformulate this task and people have, and then they get really, really good at it. So we're at about 91% of human performance. So almost at parity with humans on this task, uh, which is great, but it really sort of suggests that the task was too easy. Um, and the instructions aren't really what we'd want to tell a robot. Like I don't want to tell my Roomba, turn around and exit the library, head down the hall, and then in the cat box, I want to tell it to clean the cat box and it should just go do it. Um, so uh, this is a, a slightly older slide. I used to say the example is go clean the room with a plant. Again, now that I have cats and a Roomba in my own house, I would actually like to have it clean the litter box all the time. That's really the dirtiest place in the house. Um, but if I say go clean the room with a plant, because you know the plant gets dirty, uh, dirt falls out of the pot, the instructions under specified. The Roomba doesn't necessarily know where the plant is, especially if it hasn't been in the house for that long. Um, so we don't know what the route to take from the library to the room with the plant is. So we don't know how to get from the blue node to the green node. Um, but it's also ambiguous because I could have lots of rooms with plants, um, in which case it might not even necessarily know what the target is, even if it does have a full understanding of the map of the house. So our key insight is gonna be, if we get lost, we can just ask questions to get additional supervision from the person. So we come to an intersection, we're unsure which room to go to to end up at the room with the plant. So we just ask, should I continue into the living room or go right towards the kitchen? The person knows what room they're trying to get the room to go to, they answer the question and the navigation can continue. So we're gonna build a data set of egocentric human-human dialogues to find an underspecified ambiguous goal location in a photorealistic environment like this, building over Matterport. So if we return to our sort of notion of world scopes, we're trying to bridge world scope four and world scope five, this idea that you need to learn language by actually being embedded in an environment, but that language acquisition kind of requires having a social partner who can teach you a little bit more about the world when you're unsure what to do. So let's talk about how we collect this data set. We're gonna connect two people to a single interface. One person will pl uh, play the role of the navigator and one person will play the role of the Oracle who has more information about the environment. And we'll give them a hint, uh, like the goal room contains a mat. So the navigator gets needs to go from wherever they've started to the room with the mat. And again, the instruction is underspecified. We don't tell them how to get there and it's ambiguous. There's at least two rooms, maybe more that have mats and we don't know which one the target is. So the navigator's in a bedroom, they can sort of take the same actions as the robot, rotating left and right, moving forward. Uh, but they can also ask questions. They get to an intersection, they can ask, should I go into the hall or into the office? Now the Oracle, the other player uh, who's connected to this, to this simulation can see what a shortest path planner would do for the next couple of steps to get to the target room. But they have to communicate that information back to the navigator using natural language. So what this means is we get iterative sets of language instructions for how to follow a path. So the Oracle says, go left into the hall, follow it to a living room, navigation can continue, and we can go uh, do this question back and forth until the navigator arrives to the goal room. So I'll show a quick video of what this looks like just so you can sort of get a grounded sense of this interface. So on the left-hand side, I've got the navigator. They can move around in a simulation environment, and these blue cones represent the graph nodes. So those are places that the robot can physically be. We sort of snap between those graph nodes to do navigation. And they can ask questions to the Oracle. The Oracle is on the right side. They're watching the navigator move through the environment, but they can only act whenever they're asked a question. So we ask into the hall or the office, the Oracle uses their special Oracle view to see what a shortest path planner would do. And then they have to communicate that information back to the navigator. So they write the answer that we saw in the previous slide. And again, this back and forth continues until the navigator arrives to the room. They click yes, the room, and then the, the dialogue concludes. So there's a number of modeling challenges that arise from gathering a data set like this because we've really got a lot of moving pieces now. Um, we could try to replace the navigator navigation component with a model. So have somebody uh, take in language instructions and then train a model to follow the navigation based on the dialogue so far. We could also look at question generation. So given a navigation trajectory and sort of arriving at an intersection, how do you ask a good question that gives you a good answer to continue navigation? And we could also look at modeling the human. So modeling the person giving the instructions, if you wanted to try to train a robot that's actually helping somebody move through, say, a new office environment, like the um, Pepper robots at MSR used to. 
we're going to focus in this part of the talk on navigation, and then I'll briefly widen out and talk about how we can do the full cycle. So we frame this problem as navigating based on the dialogue history. So we've got an exchange here on the left that shows sort of how a navigator and Oracle moved through to find a rug. Um, and this is a real dialogue from the, uh, from the data that we gathered. So after each sort of turn, the navigator took some action. So when they were given the hint, they took three steps and then they said, should I go to the left or the right? They said, should I go left or right? The Oracle answered, go left and turn right after the bathroom. They took four more steps. So we can take those steps the navigator is taking and treat them as supervision to train a model for doing navigation. So our input is going to be the dialogue history so far shown in red, plus the visual frames that we've gotten at every time step. So we sort of read the dialogue history, we're standing in the room and we have to decide what to do next. So our output again is just going to be the navigation action part time step. Our goal always is just to get closer to the target object room. So rather than specifying a discrete node as our goal for every time step, we're going to say all the time you're trying to get as close as you can to the room with the rug. And this means we can turn our 2000 dialogues into 7000 instances of dialogue history because we're sort of slicing it up by question answer pair. So from this individual dialogue, we get not just one dialogue, but actually five distinct instances that we can train our model for. Uh, do we have any questions before I move on to modeling? Um, so just to be clear, you're not considering cases where, and you don't have data for cases where the, the person does the wrong thing, right? So we do have cases where the person does the wrong thing, and I'm sort of delighting that um, in this presentation. The upshot is occasionally the navigator does something dumb, like they're told what to do, and then they just don't do it, or they you know misunderstand the instruction. So what we'll actually do at the modeling step is we'll look at what the navigator did. We'll compare it to what the Oracle was shown, like those five steps. And we'll say, if the navigator followed along the path that, that the Oracle should have described and then kept going, then we trust them. And we're going to use that as our training data. But if they didn't move along the path that the Oracle described, if they you know, deviated and followed the instruction, maybe the Oracle gave a bad instruction and the navigator did the wrong thing will instead trust what the Oracle was shown those next five steps. So the model always gets good supervision. Sometimes it's really good because it's what the human did plus bonus. And sometimes it's just a shortest path plan. So the effective data will not include missteps and you're always going to be saying, what's the next step? That's right. So we're going to build on this initial sequence to sequence model that I presented earlier uh, as part of the vision language navigation benchmark. The simplest thing we can do is just encode the hint. So for go to the room with the mat, we can say the target object is a mat and that's the end of the instruction and then start decoding. And we'll get pretty far with that sometimes. So if I say the target is a toilet, you do pretty well if you just go to the nearest bathroom, right? You got a pretty good shot of answering the question of uh, ending up in the right goal room. But of course, including the last answer from the Oracle gives us a lot more information. So if the Oracle just said, yeah, head up the stairs and we know the target is a mat, we know we basically don't need to explore downstairs at all. We can just head up the stairs that we see and then we've got a better shot of getting the right uh, room. But there are cases where the last answer isn't enough. So again, these are all examples from the actual data set. Uh, once the navigator said, should I turn left down the hallway ahead? The Oracle says, yeah. So if we only encode, yeah, we're toast. The question context actually gives us the navigation instruction. The navigator described their own path and the Oracle confirmed it. So we'd like to also consider encoding the last question. So we say the navigator said, should I go upstairs? The Oracle said, yeah. Now we have even more evidence that we should go up the stairs. Sometimes that's not enough either though. So there's one example where the Oracle towards the beginning of the conversation gave this long instruction that mentioned going left at a door next to two yellow lights. The navigator got lost. Uh, they end up circling back and they're like, oh, are these the yellow lights you were talking about, you know, instructions ago? The Oracle says, yes, the navigator moves through the, the door with the yellow lights. Um, so we can also consider just encoding all the previous questions and answers, uh, limiting obviously to some max number of tokens. And what we're gonna evaluate is just whether or not adding that additional dialogue history helps. Like, is it valuable to have these dialogue exchanges if you're trying to change train a navigation agent? So we're going to train in a set of houses, and then we'll test in a new set of houses, so unseen floor plan, unseen dialogues. Uh, if we encode only the target object, we move about 1.9 meters towards the goal per uh, instruction. Uh, the goals are typically um, about five meters away. 
We get two if we add the last answer. We get a nice performance bump up to 2.25 if we add the last question, so sort of question answer context. And then we can top off a little bit at our best performance if we actually include as much dialogue history as we can fit in our LSTM batch. So adding dialogue history does help, especially in unseen environments where we're trying to learn a floor plan while also executing the navigation instruction. And we have a leaderboard running. 90% of the submissions to it so far outperform the baseline. The best um, almost doubles performance up to 4.46 meters. That's very close to actually getting to the target every time. Um, fun fact, the best model is out of USC. It's one of, it's uh, from Faye Shaw's group. Um, so I mentioned earlier that we can do more than just training agents to navigation. So if we wanted to replace this whole pipeline with two trained agents, then we need one agent that can do navigation and generate its own questions and another agent that can answer those questions. And if we can do this, we could train on human human dialogues, but we could also do sort of self training, right? The agents could just pick a random target and talk to each other and try to learn. And this is the sort of emergent communication reinforcement learning framework that a lot of people are excited about. So we've covered navigation, right? We've got a model that can do that. We can just plug in our LSTM or we can take the latest, um, greatest model off the leaderboard and just plug and play to do navigation. Uh, doing question generation is a bit more and doing question answering is a bit more. So I'll focus on question answering first. What we're basically gonna do is train an Oracle agent that tries to model what the navigator agent is going to do. So it'll generate a beam of potential answers it could give to a question and say, I think if I give this answer, the navigator will respond by doing this set of navigation. I think if I give this other answer, I think the navigator will do this other set of actions. Uh, it evaluates which of those sets of actions get it closer to the goal, and then chooses the generated answer that it believes will cause the navigator to move closer to the goal. So this means explicitly keeping a copy of the navigator model inside of the Oracle model. And we're gonna do the opposite too. So when we wanna ask a question, We'll think about the question we could ask as a navigator. Imagine, now that I have the Oracle model in my mind, if I ask this question, the Oracle model is gonna think about the answers that it could give me. And then it's going to think about how I would navigate in response to those. So we'll generate a bunch of questions, think about how the Oracle will generate answers and what navigation steps we would take in response to those answers and pick the question that leads to the answer that leads to the best navigation path. So this is a recursive model. Um, it can go arbitrarily deep. We call it the recursive mental model. It implements this sort of theory of mind intuition for dialogue driven navigation. And we can propagate all the error back from the actual navigation that ends up happening. So under the hood, we use an actor critic RL formulation to condition all of the loss across both of these agents on the final navigation error for the dialogue. Um, so this is really fun. Uh, it's an exciting paradigm to be working with, but it's a much harder problem, obviously, because you're trying to learn language generation, which is tough in the first place, and two agents simultaneously. Another exciting thing we can think about doing is taking all of this sort of human-human in simulation data and saying, like, you know, we're moving on a on a discrete graph of sort of 360 vision embeddings, and that's like fun and cool to think about from a machine learning perspective. But it's not that exciting as a roboticist because it doesn't look anything like what robotic navigation looks like. Uh, so we could just do it with robots instead. Um, so we did a similar experiment where we paired people together and had one drive a robot car and the other one tell them in a sort of non-turn taking fashion, what the instructions are. So they can ask questions, they can interrupt, barge in. So the dialogue is more complicated. The action space is continuous. Um, this is impossible to model. It's really, really tough, uh, but the paper is out and you can try it if you want to. I'll show a quick video of what it looks like just because it's exciting. So the commander says, you know, the objective is a jar of blocks. Tell me about where you are. The driver describes their surroundings. So the commander can see sort of a top-down map, but not where the driver is. So they're not getting a live feed. And then the driver has to do, uh, tell, it, tell them where they are. So you're sort of localizing and then understanding the instructions and doing the driving to try to find the target objects. Um, so this is sort of built for simultaneous localization and navigation or SLAM algorithms um, for the roboticists in the audience. Uh, so we're excited to keep building on this, but it is considerably more complex than the simple simulation-based vision and language navigation paradigm. Um, yeah, so as I've been saying, these intermixed dialogue acts, the physical robot control requiring localization just makes this task considerably harder. Um, we've got an initial model that uses this sort of navigation and dialogue history. 
Uh, but the dialogue phenomena, again, are just much more complex than what we see in the simulation only uh, version. Um, any questions on vision and dialogue navigation before I move to the sort of second half of the talk? Um, sorry, I've got many questions here. Uh, can you give me a, just a kind of general picture of like how, like in each of these data sets, I know I'm sure it ranges, but order of magnitude, like how many like scenarios are there? How many words? How expensive and time consuming and like IRB headachey is it to just create a new one? Um, so for a number of words and instruction lengths, I'd have to look at the appendices of these papers. Uh, actually, they're probably at the slides at the end of this talk. If you remind me again when the talk is over, we'll just like go past the end and see all the uh, instruction length information. IRB wise, it's not too bad. Uh, basically, I get IRB approval to gather non uh, or gather anonymous information that doesn't relate to subject demographics, right? They're just having a conversation. And then we maintain mechanical Turk IDs until the collection is over and then erase all of them and replace them with our instance specific IDs. The toughest part of collecting data like this is that you have to build out a server that's gonna connect people together and run these simulations in the back end. And that's a substantial engineering effort. Cost wise, vision and dialogue navigation was just shy of $6,000. We paid $1 per dialogue. We got about 5,000 dialogues and then a lot of you know piloting thrust. Not cheaper than I would it turns out Turkers will do tasks for cheaper if the task is more exciting than filling out surveys. Yeah, I've definitely seen that. I got a question about the environment. So, mm -hmm. uh, in or, sorry about the familiarity with the environments. So, mm -hmm. in all these cases, does the assumption is the assumption that the person who's giving the instruct navigation instructions is familiar with the entire environment? So we're trying to approximate the idea that the person giving the instruction is familiar with the environment. And we do that by giving them this sort of Oracle level view of what the driver should do next to get to the goal as fast as possible. In, uh, in reality, of course, you know, these are mechanical Turk workers. There's some issue with if somebody has been playing in the same house for a very long time, they might actually understand the house, even as a driver. We mitigated that during the data collection process by limiting the number of times the same worker could end up in the same house. But of course, there's still going to be leakage there where people can end up learning the floor plan if they've been in it before and are they're doing something very similar. Um, but hopefully it's minimal since they could only play in the same house, I think, three times maximum before I disallowed them from uh, being in the house anymore. Okay, thanks. Um, so the quick takeaway. We're just working towards enabling agents to ask questions and interpret answers to those questions on the fly for supervision. That's sort of the, the 30,000 feet goal of something like vision and dialogue navigation. So we really want agents to recognize when they're lost or confused and be able to ask for human intervention in a way that leads to successful trials. So keep that in mind as we move to interpreting grounded instructions for everyday tasks where we're gonna tackle something much more complex than just navigating around the house. So returning to my motivation, I don't just want to be able to tell the robot to head to the stove counter. I want it to subsequently be able to manipulate objects and do tasks for me. So if we want to pick up the knife on the counter beside the toaster, we need an arm. And if we introduce an arm, we introduce a whole host of new problems that we can tackle with our task planning. So back to our benchmarks. Uh, it turns out at CDPR 18, you know, something was in the water. A lot of people introduced benchmarks at the same time. They did a lot of exciting things. One of them was to actually add object interaction and world interaction for question answering. So for template based questions like how many X are there, an agent is dropped in a simulated environment and it can not only move its body, but also open and close cabinets, uh, pull and close drawers, move objects around to remove occlusions and answer questions like how many mugs are there in the kitchen. And we'd really like to, oh, sorry. And there's a system called AI Habitat that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with just in terms of this stuff actually driving progress that tries to soak up a bunch of these benchmarks and present a unified framework for them. So there's a lot of momentum in sort of doing this language grounding in embodied visual environments. But we're sort of missing uh, the, the nicest part of this graph, which is human level language for interacting with an environment that involves object manipulation and actually moving articulated objects, that is things with different uh, visible states like open and closed. So we fill that gap. We introduce action learning from realistic environments and directives, Alfred, which is a data set for training your robot butler. 
This is the first benchmark with natural language instructions for interactive tasks through an embodied agent rather than just tasks that involve navigation. So this is an example of the kinds of things we can do with Alfred. So I'll show the high level goal at the top. The agent is supposed to put the green bottle in the cabinet under the sink, but we're also gonna give low level step-by-step -step instructions saying things like carry the green bottle to the first sink on the left. We've got these nice rich referring expressions, open the third drawer from the left that involve actually interacting with the environment, doing open close, um, picking and placing objects. Here, we're gonna change the object state. So our goal is to put a clean bowl of water on the kitchen island. Uh, we're gonna do that by moving towards a bowl that's dirtied, picking it up and then wash, washing it off in the sink. So we've got our dirty bowl. We're gonna walk to the sink. We'll put the bowl down, turn the sink on and we'll see a visual state change. The bowl will go from being like very grimy to being clean and full of water and then we'll put it down and that'll be the end of our task. So we wanna train agents that can take these natural language commands in and actually create these demonstrations or follow these instructions. And moving towards our sort of world scope analysis again, this is really doubling down on world scope for like really trying to do, let's put the agent in a simulated environment, let's make that environment as rich as possible and see how far we can get with understanding language instructions that involve actually doing manipulation tasks. So to collect this data set, we think about different things the robot can do in our simulation environment. So limited by you know, simulator capabilities, how can we best explore the space of things the robot can do? So we're gonna do that in the form of what we call a task tuple, which is a sort of logical specification of what needs to happen. Like we're gonna stack a fork inside of a cup, we're gonna put the cup on a countertop, and we're gonna do all of that in kitchen three, which is one of our rendered scenes. So we can run a planner with full observability. Uh, for those of you in the planning community, we use PDDL, which is not anybody's favorite, but it works fine for this task. And we basically say, look, the end condition of this task is that there's an XYZ where X is a fork, Y is a cup, X is on Y, Z is a counter, and Y is on Z. That is, there's a fork on a cup on a countertop, and we do it in the kitchen. So we can run our planner and get a demonstration of how the robot could do that. So we put the robot in a random start position, we run our planner, the robot runs to the house, gets the fork, puts it in the cup, puts the cup on the counter, and we're good. We can show that to mechanical torque workers and say, given this trajectory, how would you describe to a robot how to do this task? And they'll tell it a high level goal, what it's supposed to do, like stack a fork on a cup on the counter, and they'll give low level step-by-step -step instructions. And because we have a planner and sort of a simulated environment, we can randomize not just the starting position of the agent, but also the starting position of all these objects and run the planner again. So get a new demonstration for kitchen three, new language annotations, run it again. For every task tuple, we get three distinct trajectories. And for every distinct trajectory, we get three distinct language annotations from different workers to describe how to do these uh, tasks. Our tasks range from simple pick and place, like put the book on the desk in a particular bedroom, up through various uh, low level cooking tasks, like slicing something or heating something up in the microwave. Under the hood, we use careful sampling to ensure there's high entropy across the items, uh, receptacles and scenes that are used to make sure there's not easy memorizable biases in the data set. And again, for every trajectory, we get three annotations. So you can see sort of the language variety here. Um, the high level goal being put a clean sponge on a metal rack or put a rinse sponge out on the drying rack. And then the instructions are sort of low level navigation and interaction uh, language. This is free form open vocabulary annotation. So far cry from the template based stuff in CDPR 18's interactive question answering paper. Um, so it's, it's complex. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big data set and it's very difficult to model. So before I talk about how we attempted to model it, I'll pause for questions and also let my cat out because he's meowing to leave the room now. No questions. Hi, uh, I have a question. So uh, mm -hmm. do they already understand these modular actions like like, are you also learning them on the go? I don't quite understand that. Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, so do the agents already understand the tasks like slice and pick, or do you also learn them within the framework? 
So I'll show that a little bit in modeling. Basically, the agent has access to um, seven actions it can take uh, that involve interacting with objects. So what it will predict is that it needs to do slice, for example. So slice is one part of the prediction, but it also has to predict where on the screen to slice. So we'll have the abstraction be, you predict a segmentation mask of what object you think needs to be sliced. And then slicing will either happen or not, depending on whether that's something that's valid in the simulation. Okay, got it. So we're gonna do an initial sequence to sequence model because that's our favorite go-to. We'll encode the entire language directive using a BioSTM. And then similar to navigation, at every time step, we'll get a visual observation from the environment. So we've been chugging along, taking actions. We're gonna encode our visual observation into an LSTM decoder. And what we wanna output is again, one of several uh, interaction actions such as put in and then where to do the put in behavior. So here, if we're looking at our language instruction, we're somewhere around uh, put the cup in the sink and then fill it with water. So we wanna predict put in, we wanna predict a segmentation mask. You'll see that this roughly corresponds to the basin of the sink, sort of carving out the spatula and the apple so that the cup doesn't end up on top of something. We take that step in the simulator. So we put in this segmentation mask, the cup goes into the sink. Now we attend to fill it with water and get that we should now toggle the sink on our segmentation mask being the handle of the sink up here in the top right. Then the water comes on, the cup is full of water, and we can move on to the next task. Under the hood, we employ a form of progress monitoring to try to regularize the language attention, basically try to estimate how far along we are in the trajectory so far and use that to determine what words we should be looking at. Sorry, are you predicting um, the, you're predicting the bitmap, right? Yes, this is a pixel-wise binary mask, so it's a it's a big ask of a of an LSTM decoder. It's a two to the something number of choices. Yeah, and modeling-wise, this can be further discretized. We used um, the full uh, visual space. Uh, subsequent modelers have found that using something like ten by ten pixel grids is sufficient to get a granular mask that can pick out the right objects. And obviously, it's much easier to infer uh, than one that's you know two fifty six by two fifty six. Um, so this initial model doesn't do great. The, the data set is challenging. Um, so we're going to look at how we perform in rooms we've been in before. That's going to be red bars and then brand new floor plans. That'll be blue bars. So on navigation, which is just, you know, left, right, forward, backwards, uh, the agent does pretty well. It gets about 50% success in rooms it's been in before, about 20% on uh, rooms it hasn't been. Interestingly, these numbers are very close to the performance of the vision language navigation, the sequence to sequence model. So our navigation task isn't much harder than the data sets that already exist. The challenge really comes in this new uh, aspect of object interaction. So if we look at things that involve predicting these segmentation masks, these binary pixel wise masks, uh, that's putting stuff down, slicing, uh, picking stuff back up and toggling. We do pretty well in rooms we've been in before, especially for big objects. So put down is often on countertops and desks and uh, tables, which have like a very big, easy to see mask. It's hard to miss. Um, but small objects like cups and knives that involve uh, these little objects are harder to predict uh, with the binary uh, classification mask. There's also subroutines like cleaning things off in a sink, cooling them in the fridge or heating them in the microwave. We do pretty well on these tasks even in unseen rooms. And that's because for things like cool and heat that involve fridges and microwaves, there's not a lot of difference in what a microwave or fridge looks like across houses. So the agent is actually learning sort of universal concepts for these appliances, which is awesome. Um, and you'll note that the performance isn't as good for cleaning because sinks in the AI2 Thor environment that we use actually do look quite different across different environments. They have different faucet styles and handles. And so the agent has a harder time generalizing on these uh, wider variety of meshes. The real problem is trying to stick all this together. So if we, instead of, uh, so in, in all these evaluations here, we're sort of rolling the agent forward on the gold trajectory and then asking it just from where you're standing now, try to clean the thing off in the sink. Um, but if we actually start from scratch and say like from the first visual observation, try to perform all of these instructions in sequence, uh, we get like almost 2% success in rooms we've been in before and zero in unseen rooms. So it's really challenging uh, to do this with a simple sequence to sequence model. It really demands uh, more complicated sort of hierarchical or object uh, aware models. 
so we ran an ECCV challenge last year uh, at a workshop and we've got an ongoing leaderboard. So the leaderboard topping model makes really impressive gains. Uh, we've gone from 4% success on scene rooms up to 31%. Uh, so that's almost an eight times increase. And from our initial model getting no success at all on unseen rooms up to almost 10%. Um, so these, these newer models use hierarchical uh, planning. So they basically say, I'm about to do navigation or I'm about to do object manipulation and train separate threads for those two things. That's the big change that all of them make. They also do a lot more sort of object aware modeling. So running faster RCNN, for example, instead of ResNet to obviously give you bounding boxes where you can actually pick out the right objects. So a lot of stuff that feels intuitive can be done to just like make this task more approachable. Um, so we're excited to see that this is still getting momentum uh, and we'll have another challenge at the Embodied AI workshop at CPR this year. So the Alpha benchmark allows us to really study how to perform this kind of long horizon task planning from language that involves both navigation and interaction with the world. So to briefly recap, I'd like to move towards language guided robots as, as a person and as a, as a researcher. Um, we have language guidance for embodied systems like Alexa and Google that don't have visual connections. Um, but when we move into the space of requiring visual grounding, uh, we make a lot of demands of NLP as a field to sort of change. Um, so while I try to enable robots to perform language grounding via interacting with humans, I also sort of argue that we need to do that as a field in NLP to move towards uh, action level grounding and social level grounding with other agents. Because understanding language requires a lot of context and these sorts of data sets that I've introduced start to allow us to translate these natural language commands into these complex long horizon planning problems that involve navigating across big graphs or interacting with objects that have lots of states. So I've talked about vision and dialogue navigation, where we enabled agents to ask questions and interpreting grounded instructions for everyday tasks, where we tried to train agents to reason for complex things that require interaction and really hierarchical planning. Um, I have a little bit of time to talk about future work before we move into questions. Uh, I just want to mention that these benchmark APIs uh, reveal some language ambiguity that I think is exciting to think about for the future. So we say open the blank all the time, just open is a good verb that we use. Um, in our current abstraction, that means put the gripper at a place and perform an open action. But translating that into robot actuation will look very different for things like open the door versus open the toilet tank. So one's one-handed, one's two-handed. Um, open the book only requires a finger. And open the wine bottle actually requires using a whole tool to do things. Open is not actually an atomic action in the way that we maybe at first blush think of it as humans. It requires a large range of motor skills uh, and it's very conditional on the type of object that we plan to be opening. So this is a cool, more robotic side level problem that I think we'll have to address as a community in the future. And it actually make the argument that any API for robot control like this uh, from language is gonna miss low level details. At some level of granularity, we stop describing in language what the differences are because we understand them as people who speak the same language. Um, so we're always going to need on the fly arbitrarily low level language instructions for the robot to say like, hey, I've never opened a wine bottle before and it doesn't look like I can just twist it like a handle. Can you teach me how to do it? So dialogue enabled agents can request that kind of supervision as needed. And I can't talk about what I'm doing at Amazon, especially because the talk is recorded, but I can talk about what would be exciting to be doing for future work, um, which would be if we're you know, training an agent to put potato slices in a skillet on the stove, maybe we've trained it on Alfred, it's really good at doing this. So it slices up a potato, puts the skillet on the stove. Now we tell it fry the potatoes. Well, it doesn't know how to fry the potato slices. It's never seen that verb. But we can bring together sort of action learning and active learning strategies to drive a human robot dialogue, which is just to say, have the robot ask, show me how to do this. And have the human, if they're in the environment with the robot, uh, teach the system how to fry the potatoes, you know, ignite the bottom right burner, add some oil. Um, and if we're in the physical world, we could do that by learning from demonstration, by having the human either teleoperate the robot or physically move the joints to, to try to show it what to do while describing it. So human-robot interaction can teach skills that are not represented in static corpora and enable sort of lifelong learning on these robot platforms as they move into home and office spaces. Um, so as a community, I think we need to like focus on trying to move out of just reading the internet into these spaces of looking at pictures and video, 
putting agents in embodied situations and in the physical robots and trying to have human robot interaction where we are learning continuously from our language partners. Because you can't learn language from the internet, uh, a television or alone. Um, so thanks everybody for the talk. I'm gonna leave up the links for the papers that I discussed, Vision Dialogue Navigation and Alfred. These are the collaborators that I had uh, for those works, mostly at UW, uh, NVIDIA and AI2. Um, and then I've done a, a number of works since then uh, that I'll leave up as well that we mentioned briefly in the talk. Um, and I think we have some time for questions now too. Uh -huh. Thanks so much, Jesse, for the insightful talk. I think now I can open the room to questions and we can take questions. So I can ask a question, but everybody else should go first. <laughs> I have a question. So uh, in your seek to seek model for training the uh, navigation, what kind of loss do you compute inside a sequence? So I assume, let's say you, one of the step was put the glass in the sink mm -hmm. and uh, what kind of loss is computed for that particular sequence? Yeah, so there's, uh, there's two losses actually that are weighted together. One is, was the right action selected? So that's put down, pick up, slice, open, close, toggle on, toggle off. Like there's all these things the robot can do with its hand. Um, so that's just a cross entropy loss of which action was chosen. So we weight the cross entropy loss together with a um, uh, image reconstruction loss for the binary pixel wise segmentation mask of the object. And that's inverse class weighted. So a lot of the masks are blank, right? They have like a very small object that needs to be picked up. So just doing a straight cross entropy loss is inappropriate. Um, instead, we do a reconstruction loss and then down weight by basically the number of uh, on versus off pixels. So that if you're trying to learn a very small object, you don't get super penalized for predicting a small mask. Um, one immediate consequence of that that we noticed is this thing we showed in the table where uh, very large objects that are hard to miss uh, end up with higher success because the loss is also closer to just being balanced when there's an even number of black and white pixels. So a lot of these newer models that move to just getting the bounding box from faster RCNN or from a segmentation model that's separate and then using those bounding boxes or segmentation models directly ends up giving much better performance than trying to do this imagery construction loss. Um, thank you. So does that mean uh, the ground, the data set has a bounding box of where to put the object? So you can compute it, the loss. A little, a little better. It actually has the, the, the ground truth segmentation mask for the object. So you can compute a bounding box from it, but we actually give you every pixel that is visible on the object. Okay, thank you. Do we have, uh, Ron has also a question. Yeah, so uh, you mentioned a lot of visual, um, uh, you know, the needs to use the robot with visual uh, information. But when you talk about especially actions like opening, slicing, there's a lot more than visuals. There's tactile information, especially. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that in any way simulated or trying to get that? Yeah, so it's not currently, and it's a real bummer. Um, so this is a, a larger discussion that I'm happy to have with a lot of people at some point, um, like whenever we're in person again and at bars. But working in simulation sucks. Right, there's so much that's missed that can't be captured. And even if it is captured, it's captured to the degree that it's possible in the simulation. And so there's a lot of things that just can't be well studied in a sim. And one of them is haptics and sort of tactile feedback. So like you're mentioning, if you wanna slice something, we can slice things with our eyes closed, right? We, we have proprioception, we know where our hands are. It's maybe not a great idea for fingers, but like conceptually you could just feel the potato out and slice it on your own. Um, so moving towards doing experiments on things like this local bot that I showed is what I'm planning to do in the next year or so to try to be able to incorporate more of this proprioception, knowing with our eyes closed where our arms are and tactile feedback of like, as you start applying pressure to something, you actually get a lot of physical feedback from the environment on what to do. John, I think you also had a question. I also I do, but I see, I see Kay Feng. Uh, yeah, okay, thanks. Thanks, Professor. Okay, thanks for the great talk. Uh, right, so yeah, this might 
be a dumb question. Uh, so I always saw uh, grounding, I mean, this term uh, in different contexts, but somehow I feel there's, there's no uh, definition for this word. So uh, can you explain in a high level what exactly grounding mean? Sure. So this is a, a big point of contention, I think, between especially the language community and the vision community. Uh, if you read this paper, Experience Scrum's Language, you can see sort of the full scope of the argument. But the upshot is, for me, uh, grounding is taking a language token or language phrase and connecting it to a series of physical perceptions. So that would be uh, not, not a photograph, but like actually physically the world. So if I say the computer mouse, it means not just what the mouse looks like, but what it feels like, what its affordances are, the little clicky buttons. It's connecting the uh, language phrase to a set of sensory experiences and ideally the ability to mentally simulate those experiences. So doing it um, from the vision community side, I think typically when somebody defines grounding, um, they mean tie a word to a bounding box. And I wanna emphasize that I don't mean tie a word to a bounding box. Um, I really want to tie a word to a series of, of physical exper experiences, which, is, which begins to be possible in simulation because uh, you get you know visual and maybe a little bit of affordance, but is really only possible in a physically embodied robot that has a gripper and the ability to to touch and get uh, sensation from an object. I see. I see. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, Shikar has also raised his hand, and I apologize if I butchered your name, but go ahead. Yeah, uh, I had a question for the Alfred task, uh, mm -hmm. like specifically like the goal and instructions. So was there any study or evaluation done on, let's say, if we only provide goals instead of instructions and, and, and sort of what does that sort of level of abstraction mean like, or for these models? Like, so was there any Yes, this is a great question. So the goal instructions sort of come off as, as odd, I think, in the, in the way we discussed the data set now. So I'll describe the motivation for them. Our plan was uh, release this data set. Everyone will immediately solve it because it shouldn't be that hard. And then we'll iterate and say, okay, now that you know how to do it with these low level instructions, can you do it just from the goal? Like we wanted to train agents that could actually learn how to do abstract task planning, such that when I say cook a potato slice, the agent infers, all right, I got to find a knife. I got to take the knife to the potato, slice it, take the slice, put the slice on the skillet, put the skillet on the stove, turn the stove on. That's not what happened. Um, because it turns out the task is much harder to model than we imagined it would be. Um, so a long horizon vision for the Alfred data set is still, if these models get close to human parity, if we get up to you know, 70, 80% success rates on seen or unseen environments, we'll release a secondary leaderboard where you only get the goal, like put a potato slice on the stove and cook it, or um, fill a glass with water and put it on the countertop, and then are allowed to ask for high level or for low level instructions. And then models will be penalized for sort of asking for these low level additional um, instructions in the same way that in CBDN we can ask questions about what we should do next. Um, yeah, the upshot is the goal instructions were originally gonna be our task specification and the modeling problem turned out to be much harder than we thought it was. So now we're just using the whole instruction set. Yeah, just a comment on that, like based on the trajectories you happen to show, like all the depth of the clips, it like it became apparent that yeah the goal probably was to like since there's no ambiguity in the goal itself like for a given data point so mm -hmm. i assume that yeah probably that's the eventual goal of abstraction so, sounds yeah good. that's right thank, thank you thank you i don't see any other hands raised did i miss anybody so do we have any other questions uh hi this is yeah i have a quick question sure. uh, so uh, I think uh, here we uh, roll out a very uh, interesting, uh, um, I guess, um, future uh, um, interaction in terms of uh, the in, uh, in, in terms of the language and image, uh, videos, computer vision field, and robotics. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe these questions are a little bit further, but I think it could be also essential because this is going to be an integrated system. Uh, so one part is about uh, the hardware uh, requirement for 
uh, this to be feasible uh, because now we're talking about all these uh, vision, language, robotics, uh, control uh, all together, right? I mean, in order to make it even also uh, online uh, with the immediate uh, feedback interaction with the environment, uh, what type of uh, uh, hardware requirement this would actually uh, demand for this to be workable? And then the second part uh, also, uh, as I mentioned, also very uh, futuristic question is that, what about all the oh, I might've lost you there at the second of the, the last question. These, uh, I'm sorry, Jan, I think you cut off for the second half of the second question. Oh, sorry. Uh, so uh, the second question is about uh, the privacy uh, aspect. Mm -hmm. That is, um, that in order for the system to be really uh, deployable, right? And there's a lot of concern regarding the privacy aspect. And I know this is a very futuristic question, but I, I was just wondering if you thought about that. I have, um, especially about hardware. So mm -hmm. a common complaint from anybody outside of robotics is when we talk about this kind of work, robots suck, right? Like they're not very good at doing anything yet outside of like very constrained factory environments where they're doing like quick assembly. Um, like the Roomba is okay. It doesn't have a lot to do. It just got a little vacuum and even it gets stuck um, and needs me to come rescue it from the vent. Um, so one thing uh, to think about for me is there's sort of, two immediate applications for at-home robots that I think are reasonable. One is uh, for differently abled folks who are using things like powered wheelchairs. We don't think about a powered wheelchair as being like a robot, but it is typically joystick controlled. It sometimes has an arm that's also joystick or straw controlled and being able to give language commands to those systems um, that can then learn from the user who's using them. Seems like a promising direction for sort of, um, especially progressive illnesses like Parkinson's where like maybe you can start being able to operate the, tele, the joystick, but eventually you can't. So being able to give language instructions becomes necessary. The other is just elder care for in-home robots. So during your entire question, I was trying to remember the name of the recent company that put out a relatively inexpensive robot. Um, I'll have to find it after the talk. It looks like a light. It looks like a light pole. Like it's a very thin robot with a long arm. Yeah. Um, it's it's pretty cheap. I think 15k. Uh -huh. It's got a squishy gripper, and uh -huh. it's three uh, a meter and a half tall, so it can get to low countertops and things. Mm -hmm. So like the hardware is maybe going to get there. One thing that I uh, try to focus on in this work is that I'm trying to move towards the ability to collaborate with these systems. So what I'd like to see is you know if we've got your 1.5 meter robot, it's trying to help out around the house with cooking or something, it's not gonna be able to slice a potato. That's actually totally unrealistic, right? This is too complicated, too handed. So what it should do is bring me a knife, bring me a potato, put them near me while I'm cooking and then say like, you know, you were gonna slice the potato. So here's the, the tools for you. So I wanna move more towards like, how can we take our affordances, which is we can do whatever we want in the world because we have opposable thumbs and fingers and work together with a system that has substantially less actuation capability to try to get something done faster. So I think focusing on that sort of intersection of human robot collaboration is the most exciting way to move forward without being too hung up on the fact that the hardware is just not that good yet. Um, for privacy, I think this question is more about like federated learning. Like could we have all these agents operating in different people's homes and all learn from each other? And that would be really cool, but it's also super dystopian. So probably we have to do as much learning as we can in a lab and in simulation, deploy, and then have algorithms on the system that just learn from the person they're interacting with, but don't share that information outside of any local network. Yeah, thank you. This is really uh, interesting. Yeah, we'll uh, love to talk more afterwards. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? So I would like to ask a question. And one thing that I was thinking, I uh, I understand that you say how it's important to sort of bring together these two spaces, more like just uh, understanding language from internet, understanding or what we can do with the internet data versus in this other uh, more uh, further space where we have interaction. And I was, 
I want, I was wondering, you also brought up Kana in the middle when you are, when you were speaking about uh, uh, handling the Alfred task, uh, how it basically needs more uh, architectures with hierarchical nature. I was wondering, sort of in more domain, do you think there's anything missing from the language world? Like, are there any uh, capabilities or things that you find missing from the NLP uh, perspective that would be good to have or add for this sort of bringing these two words together to work better? Um, to some degree, yeah. I think historically, NLP, especially uh, somebody like me, came up in Raymond Mooney's lab at UT Austin. Semantic parsing was a big part of my graduate program, right? I, I really believed in semantic parsing in like 2013. Um, and we've kind of stopped doing it as a language community. Not entirely, but like most major conferences are, you know, straight deep learning, maybe a little bit of query understanding, um, but like a core semantic parsing task is no longer super interesting to the average grad student. And a lot of the Alfred stuff looks like semantic parsing, right? So the task like uh, put a clean bowl of water on the table. That's a, you know, we could create a semantic formalism that says uh, lambda x such that lambda that such that x is a bowl and it's full of water and it's on some y that is a countertop. That's even what the PDDL plan looks like. So I think starting to think about language more in the context of how it relates to robot planning is a super exciting uh, half-baked space in my head um, because robot planning and semantic parsing already look really similar and it feels like if the NLP community worked with planning a little bit more especially with physical agents we might be able to get really far um, in that space this is a very like long-winded and also half-baked answer I apologize for that but it is something I've been mulling over in the back of my head that's great and I think we uh, when we get to our group meeting, we also have an interesting talk, which might have sort of uh, one of our PhD students will talk about what he's working on. And I think it, there will be some nice overlaps. And I Great. think it will be nice to hear your uh, thoughts on it. If we don't have any other questions, I think we can thank Jesse for the very interesting talk and give him some little break before the one-on-one -on -one meetings start. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.